This large home with its stunning woodwork and elegant staircase has stood in New Bedford, Massachusetts for nearly 140 years. Its sheer size, with nearly 8,500 square feet, has led it to be more than a typical family home. It was built by a forward-thinking mill owner and later became the home of the city doctor, the headquarters for the American Red Cross, and most recently a refuge for terminally ill children and their families. Let's explore the many stories that have unfolded within these walls. This home is the largest single-family home in the city of New Bedford. It features six bedrooms and four and a half bathrooms with 92 windows and 10 fireplaces. The impressive foyer is 20 by 16 and looks like it should be in a movie, with the history of this home being equally as intriguing. Before the arrival of Europeans, the New Bedford area was home to the Wampanoag tribe, who had settlements throughout southern New England. The Wampanoags were a matrilineal society where women could own and pass down property and who actively participated in gathering food while men hunted and fought in wars. The early encounters between Europeans and Native Americans were friendly. The Wampanoags helped the pilgrims survive during their early years through planting and fishing, but they suffered from devastating plagues which greatly reduced their population. Colonists were said to have nursed the Wampanoag leader, Massasoit, back to health in 1623. With the arrival of more colonists, New Bedford became home to a large Quaker population, a religious sect who were ironically persecuted by the Puritans of Plymouth. Puritans and Quakers are two Christian denominations that originated in England. Puritans believe that followers are inherently sinful and must be taught by ministers and receive sacrament to find salvation, while Quakers believe that each individual can have a direct relationship with God. Quakers believe in equality between men and women, oppose slavery, do not drink alcohol, and are opposed to any type of warfare. The land where this home sits was purchased by English colonists in 1652 through a treaty. However, the Wampanoags contend that the treaty was for the use of the land and not an outright purchase, which they did not believe in. But with tremendous population loss for the Native Americans due to sickness and war, offset by an ever-growing European influx, this land eventually came to be purchased by William Dillwyn Howland in 1884. William Howland was born in New Bedford on March 27, 1853. He was part of a prominent Quaker family who helped settle the city of New Bedford in the 18th century. The Howlands had been prosperous in, the, in New Bedford's whaling industry, which at one point made New Bedford the wealthiest city in the world per capita. William graduated from Brown University and took a job as a clerk in the Wimsutta Textile Mill in New Bedford. On September 22, 1875, he married Caroline Thomas Childs in New Bedford. They welcomed son Llewellyn Howland in 1877 and later son Edward Morris in 1884. In 1882, at the age of 29, Howland established his own mill, the New Bedford Manufacturing Company. Two years later, Howland and his associates organized the Howland Mills Corporation, with the first mill being constructed in only three months in what was expected to be an eight-mill complex. New England textile mills were often full of new immigrants, French-Canadian, English, Irish, Greek, and Polish, with children as young as 10 years old working 10- to 12-hour days as massive machines churned out fabric with deafening fervor. However, what made Howland Mills so unique was that it offered an upscale residential community for mill operatives. A far cry from the triple-deco tenements that surrounded other mill cities, Howland had three unique single-family floor plans built along wide, sloping, picturesque tree-lined streets. The idea was that to manufacture the finest yarns, the mill required the best and brightest operatives, who deserved quality living conditions, including low rents, which were roughly 15% of pay, which was deducted directly from weekly paychecks. These photos show some of the Howland Mills homes as they stand today in what is known as the Howland Mills Historic District of New Bedford. Some homes show their age, while others have been updated and modernized for today's families. Howland was known as a fair and just owner, likely guided by his Quaker upbringing, who during an 1894 mill strike that affected several mills opted not to reduce rate wages as other companies had done, prompting a thank you letter to be published in the local paper on behalf of the mill workers. 
However, within a few years, everything would change. In April 1897, Frank Hadley, the treasurer of the Bennett and Columbia Mills of New Bedford, was arrested on charges of falsifying the year-end 1896 financial statements of the mills to the state. A full financial investigation was launched into all of New Bedford's mills. Hadley was put on house arrest as he was very ill at the time and was tended by Dr. Charles Prescott, who was the doctor for the City House of Corrections. Frank Hadley died the morning of April 23, 1897 from kidney failure. Just a few hours after Hadley's death, Howland met with the National Bank of Commerce, which refused to offer any credit unless there was a complete review of the books. Howland then met with his bookkeeper, Harry Pierce, and reportedly said, Well, Harry, the game's up. The bank has refused to let us have any more money, and they want to put a man on the books to see if I'm a thief. It's too much for me, and all that's left for me to do is to go and hang myself. Pierce tried to calm Howland, and the two men went for a walk. Howland said that he would go down to the wharf and go for a sail to calm his nerves. At the wharf, William spoke with the man who was doing work on his boat before walking away. Later that morning, William didn't show up to an emergency meeting at the mills. It was thought that he may have gone to Boston to try to secure financing from other banks, but the trouble surrounding Hadley made banks hesitant to offer support to any of New Bedford's mills. Others thought that he may have escaped to find sanctuary at his summer cottage in New Hampshire. Days passed with no sight of William Howland. His wife Caroline wrote letters in search of her husband throughout New England, but to no avail. Liens were put against this home in an effort to collect unpaid debts. On Thursday, May 6, 1897, a man who was looking for work along the wharf noticed a body floating face down in the water. A call was made to the city inspector who collected the body and confirmed that it was William D. Howland. His body was bloated but with no visible injuries, and he was still wearing his overcoat, gloves, and derby hat that he was last seen wearing on April 23rd. His pocket watch was found to have stopped at 10.14 a.m. He was 44 years old. It was here that William last said his goodbyes to his wife Caroline and two young sons, ages 10 and 3, the morning of April 23rd. Perhaps he was still optimistic that the bank would come through. William had achieved so much at such a young age and really tried to do something good for the working man. But his altruistic ambitions were not financially sound. It became clear that renting to employees made it difficult to collect rents once they were no longer employed at the mills, and each dwelling only collected a fraction of the amount it cost to build the scenic suburban community, complete with indoor plumbing and underground wastewater systems. This home, which still features the letter H prominently displayed on its front elevation, went up for option in September 1897 as the Howland estate was liquidated. Guess who went on to purchase it? someone who has factored into our story and who had the means to purchase the largest home in town, Dr. Charles Prescott, the jailhouse physician who attended the death of Frank Hadley the same day that William Howland went missing. Charles Prescott was born February 10, 1845 in Meredith, New Hampshire. He graduated from Dartmouth College in 1865 with a medical degree. He married Martha Knowles on February 15, 1871. They had one son, Henry, who was born in 1876. Charles served as the doctor for the city of New Bedford before becoming the doctor at the New Bedford Jail. He also helped establish St. Luke's Hospital in 1884. Martha passed away in 1890, and Charles remarried Ida F. Cummings on June 22, 1895. Ida delivered a stillborn son on April 2, 1896. By 1900, Charles, Ida, and Henry were living in this home along with two Irish servants. Charles operated his medical practice out of this home until 1910 when he retired. By 1920, Charles and Ida continued living in this home along with their servants and a nurse. Charles was suffering from a long illness and passed away on March 22, 1920 from arteriosclerosis, which is a hardening of the arteries. In 1930, Ida continued living in this home accompanied by her younger brother Frank, along with a servant and a cook. Ida lived here until her death in 1940 and seemingly escaped the worst of the Great Depression in this massive home. 
She was active in women's groups and the social agendas typical of her day, but I sensed the loss of her infant son in 1896 haunted her, and she longed to have children's footsteps echoing through these halls. I found one interesting reference to Ida Prescott from 1901, where she was granted guardianship of a two-year-old boy named George. But I found no other references to Ida and George, and by 1910, 12-year-old George was working as a servant for a family on Nantucket. George did grow up and marry, but I wonder if this is yet another indication of Ida's desire for children to fill this home. In 1941, shortly after Ida's death, this home was acquired by the American Red Cross. It was from these rooms that the local response effort for World War II was launched. Nurses were trained, supplies were shipped, and blood drives were held to help the thousands of wounded soldiers. Blood drives continue to be an integral part of how this home served the community for the next 40 years. Years later, between 2001 and 2004, this home served as a hospice facility for terminally ill children. According to newspaper articles about the facility, most hospices will not take children, and hospitals will keep children clinically alive, but at a tremendous cost. Here, children and their families, many of whom had cancer, were able to experience Christmas mornings and precious moments together with proper medical care grieve the final moments of life that came much too quickly, but also find strength and hope through counseling and support. But once again, the willingness to help others came at a price, much like it did with William Howland, as this home was foreclosed upon once again, forcing those most in need to look elsewhere. Perhaps it is the sheer size of this home that lends itself to helping others, but it has proudly served the New Bedford community in many ways throughout the years. First is the home of William Howland, a Quaker who had a vision for a happy, prosperous working class, deserving of comfort and security. But his vision was cut short by the greed and corruption of others, which led him to lose all hope for the future. Then, for over 20 years, it was the home of Dr. Prescott, who cared for residents and inmates alike. And for 40 years, it was where his wife Ida, who may have longed to be a mother herself, lived as she cared for orphaned children before it became the headquarters for the American Red Cross and eventually as a refuge for terminally ill children and their families in their darkest moments. I never know what stories I might find when I start researching a house, but with this home, I feel like it has an important story that needed to be shared, one of service and help to those in need. Unfortunately, I have not reached the subscriber threshold to host a fundraiser on YouTube. However, in the description, I have included links to organizations that can reach those who have been touched by this house. Habitat for Humanity, in honor of providing comfort and security to those in need. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, in honor of William Howland, who tried to help others, but was unable to find help when he needed it most. The American Red Cross, which continues to serve in times of crisis, and St. Jude's Children's Hospital in honor of the children who never got to go home. Perhaps we can all be part of this home's legacy of helping others.